Hello, this is John Frenet from Ion Annapolis and the Maryland Crabs podcast with a special election crab cake episode for your listening pleasure. In June, we held a mayoral forum that was very, very well attended. And you can, and quite honestly, you should, go listen to that one. And you can find it on themarylandcrabs.com. But today, we bring you the voices of all of the other candidates running for alder person. Well, all but one of them. Republican candidate for Ward 1, Larry Clausen, did not respond to any of our requests. While we would have liked to have presented a forum or a debate with these 17 individuals, it just wasn't practical. So, we took it to the road so you can learn a little bit more about each of them in order to help us all make an informed vote. All of the questions were essentially the same to keep it fair, and we are releasing them all at the same time. Tune in and listen as your candidates answer some crucial questions about the city of Annapolis and how they plan to handle it should they be successful. Thanks for listening. Enjoy and be sure to vote. Right now I am here with John Moyer, which actually goes by the name Bumper. Nickname. Everybody in eSport has a nickname, back That's, at least from the era I came from. So. It could have been worse, I suppose. It could have been worse. <laughs> it could have been Blossom. Or yeah, well, yeah, Alderman Blossom. That doesn't. That just doesn't sound really well. Bumper Moyer is running for Alderman in Ward 8. He's in a contested primary this year, which is unusual in that it's been the first contested primary in, in several years, anyhow, several election cycles. And he'll be facing Alder, current Alderman Ross Arnett in the primary, which is going to be on September 17th of this year. And we, what we were doing is we're going around to all the Aldermanic candidates and we're going to just ask them some questions about them, their wards, what they can do, what they bring to the table, and hopefully give the people that are listening or reading or watching or whatever uh, a little bit better insight and give them some better information on who to vote for. You can pitch me all you want. You can't get my vote. I live in Ward 7. Oh, so uh, until, until, you, until, until you run for mayor, then, you know, <laughs> then, then we'll then talk. I got you. Awesome. You know, you've, you've been a lifetime resident of Annapolis, and sure. your family has a, a deep roots in city politics. Sure. Your mother was mayor. Your father was mayor. The rec center is named after you. Not you, but your father. Correct. Was your father an alderman too? He was. Okay, so when I was born in '64. He was alderman. He became mayor in '65 to '73, two terms. Okay. And then you can't run again for a third right. term consecutively. You can come back and right. run, but you couldn't. So he was, that's when he left in '73. Right. So there, there are some deep roots there, and I, I mentioned to say that you probably know the area that you're hoping to represent pretty well. What do you think specifically is the most pressing issue here in Ward Eight? Uh, and which is and Ward Eight for those that are aren't, aren't aware is Eastport. So it's kind of from I'm going to say generally Tyler Avenue where it hits Bay Ridge down. Yes. Now uh, the other community on the other side of that Green Acres, if you go across Tyler into that community, that's Ward Eight too now. Right. And then if you were to go out of Annapolis along Tyler and cut back on President Street. And circle around Eastport Terrace and Harbor House around. So everything. Okay, so that Colony Hills is, is is Ward Eight, but not Harbor House or Eastport Terrace. That's okay. Kenny's Ward. Right. They've uh, they've turned around and sort of carved out. I know Harbor a lot of the public housing. I know on yeah. Forest Drive outside of Robinwood, if you stand in the middle of the intersection, you put one foot on one side and the other one on the other one, you've got your left foot in Ward 5, your right foot in Ward 7, and running right between you is Ward 6. Yeah, it could, I think uh, it's, there's enough, uh, there's an, there are enough reasons to uh, look into possibly changing the structure of our wards at some future date. At least look at it. Only. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But specifically to, to Ward 8 and to Eastport, what are the most pressing issues facing the ward right now? Okay. You have to look at it from your status in the community. There's people who have been here forever. When I say forever, I don't mean 10 years or 20 years. I mean 60, 70, 80 sure. years. The issues to, the, to the, that block of people, I believe, is they want to feel that they're being listened to and that they matter, that they still have a presence in the community. And even though they live in a very wealthy area, for example, this end of the peninsula, they may not have lots and lots of wealth, they're property rich, but maybe not cash rich. And they want, don't want to feel like because they're not of a certain socioeconomic status in life, they still have presence, they still, want, they, they still matter, their opinions still matter. So to them, things like um, being listened to, as well as access to uh, the rec center at a, at a very cost, of, uh, affordably, uh, in, a for, in an affordable way, is important. And I've heard that. Like they, there's scuttlebutt, some people want to privatize the rec center. They would be almost universally against it. 
that are I mean, from the older, this is the older, the mm -hmm. 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, have lived here that long kind of thing. There's some, uh, to uh, uh, people who maybe are a little more new, it's the quality of life issue of traffic and overgrowth. They're, they're, that's the number one issue for them. The people along the President Street corridor, it's all about safety and violence, so and crime. That's the issue that most that most concerns them. So I, that's what I believe so, most the issue that most concerns them. So you've got so, so you've got inclusion, lifestyle, and crime. It's crime. Now, and I imagine if you go out to the Severn House or farther down, access to Bay Ridge in an easy way okay. would be a it would be a, would be top would be high on the list. That you know because right. we don't we don't think about it as we're making our going straight down, whizzing by, but when they have to pull out, there's no lights there. Imagine, imagine coming out at 8 o'clock in the morning and wanting to take a left. You know, it's, you know, it's frustrating. I'm sure it's frustrating. So issues that may not, I may not be, that may not be uh, on the plate of people at this part of eSport are going to be different at the other end. Likewise, going into a little bit more of a broad thing, do you feel that those are the same issues that are facing the city as a whole as an issue, or is there some, are there other issues yeah, for, in the I city? Think it's facing the city as a whole. Uh, absolutely, quality of life issues, which particularly refer to growth and traffic, crime is always up there. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to tell you a little story. There's a Seasport Landing project that's supposed to maybe coming in, maybe not, being fought, and that was like anybody else. Oh, Jesus, man, 127 units, more cars, oh, let's make traffic horrible, right? And that was solidly there, without talking right. to anybody. My own first impression without any right. input, when I first heard about it, right? It's, 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 and I actually heard about something happening three and a half years ago, four years ago, but it really came to the fore in the last 12 months. And then I saw the structure, the, you know, what it looks like in the presentation. Well, maybe it's not so bad, but you know, maybe it's not as bad as I was thinking. Leo did a great job, it looks excellent. And then I started, and I'm a numbers guy, hey, well, the numbers don't make sense. It's the, uh, the density calculations don't work. Well, there's a, bu a beautiful truth to numbers, and if it's a certain amount of acreage that's getting developed, and that's, it represents so many square feet, and you're allowed so many units per square feet, blah, 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 well, that's all they can have. And then I went to a city council meeting, and there was a gentleman, a Hispanic gentleman, who represents the community, and he started to speak. And he started talking about this. We're talking about traffic problems and sitting in our car for five or 10 minutes, and those kind of developments are exactly what the people he represents want. When you're making twenty or $30,000 a year, you want projects that bring jobs at a level that you want. So now I had to sit back and think about it for a minute. My point of view works for a certain group, a certain percentage of the population, a certain group of people. Sure. My point of view does not work for another group of people. And we're all in this together. So what's the answer that makes it all good for everyone? What makes it, a lot of people don't care. I don't care what it works for them. They're in Ward 7 or Ward 5 or whatever. You know? sure. so, so I actually I started to think of it you know, again a little differently. I, 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 look, I have to drive in the morning my kids to school. I've got when they go, I have a special needs, uh, my second son has special needs. I have to take them all the way out to parole. I'm in it. I'm in the mix in the morning, right? Doing what everybody else does. And, and I get frustrated with traffic like anybody else. And I don't want one more car. Most of the time, I don't want, then I have to think, as I'm frustrated with traffic, I'm seeing hordes of people who don't have a car. They're walking their kids. It's 38 degrees and drizzling. Guess what? They're walking their kids. At least I have a car kind of thing. So I just I have to put things into perspective. Again, development and growth is an absolute issue to everybody, and it matters. But there's other people who look at development and growth through a different lens, and, they, and then it has to be considered as well. And for those that weren't aware of the Eastport Landing Project, that's down by the Eastport Shopping Center. Uh, they wanted to redevelop the, I want to say the southern end of it, if you will, into 127 apartment units. And the density calculation initially was done on the full acreage of that center, I believe. I'm, I'm really simplifying it, yeah, as no, opposed to just the area that they're looking to develop, which is the southern end, which is actually, kind of actually, vacant now. I'm looking at it to be the northeast end. Okay. The north end side. The, the theater end the of this. The theater end. That's the, the old theater. The, the, uh, where, where deals produce is and everything else. So, uh, And that's likely to end up in court or something along Possibly. the lines. But that's, or they may just pick up, their, get too frustrated and leave. And then right. it sits empty, and who knows what the next group of people would come in with. True. The mayor and the council likely are gonna be made up of different parties. I do not see a sweep of Democrats or a sweep of Republicans in this election by any means. And as a Democrat uh, with potentially a, maybe a Republican mayor or some other Republicans on council, how do you, how do you plan to work together? This is gonna frustrate the Democratic Central Committee and anybody higher up in the Democratic Oh God, party. I love a good a bit of frustration. Okay, right. <laughs> anybody up higher, but it shouldn't on a local level Many of the issues we face, ideology should not play a part in it. 
part of the decision making. Oh, he's a Republican or, or she's a Democrat, whatever. I can't work with them. That should not even factor in. It's what's best for the community. And so if what's presented by a Republican, let's say, say I get along and panel ladies gets along, for example. Right. But it's, I feel, and my constituents feel it's, best, it's good for the community, I'll, I'll gladly work with them. I, I'm, I'm in it for the community. I'm not in it for the ideology or the party. I mean, I, I, I want to hear what the community, and the community means not just Eastport, Greater Annapolis wants, and we, we, we sit down and we and in a less vertical structure, more horizontal structure, bring everybody in to the table, as many people as want to get involved and figure out the problems. What has the present council and mayor, uh, what have they done that you would have done that you look at and say, oh, there's no way in hell I would have done that? What's Right off the bat, I would never have sold the golf course without other bids. Absolutely. You got one bid, count, 3.1 million. It may be the best bid you're ever going to get. It may be the greatest deal you're ever going to get. You would never know because it was never put out for other proposals. There was never, nothing was ever put out and they moved very quick on it, quickly on it. Right. Yeah, absolutely would never have done it. I, 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 I do not understand that the, 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 the governing, the ruling, the, the controlling body, the county, runs it down and then uses that as the negotiating tactic to sell it, to, 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 to take control. To, uh, to, uh, to buy it at a potentially a bargain basement price. The 50 prices. year lease was a 50 year lease. We knew it was coming down five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, six years ago, whatever. We all knew this was coming to wait till the last moment and then say, oh, we got to rush up and do this thing and push it through. It, it, absolutely, I can't see any wisdom in that at all. I, I, I mean, I tried, right? And again, Mike may have led a coalition because Mike got the votes. Mike didn't do this by himself. Mike got the votes to make this happen, right? So if anybody wants to be up on Mike on this, they've got to go to the other four people that voted with him or five or six or whatever the vote was. Well, that's, that's what we always hear. So that, you know, nobody, is a, nobody stands alone and you need to- uh, It's need, a weak form of mayor government. He has you, one vote. Just you need like to have five, eight, five votes to make anything work. Just like the other eight council members. He has, yeah, he's, um, the rec center downtown. Mm -hmm. To me, the most I was behind in theory was the uh, University of Maryland proposal. I okay. Love I love the thought of them putting uh, environmental studies in there and people populating it and going out and spreading their money for lunch and you get a continual uh, and getting the rent money forever, the lease money forever on that thing. I don't think selling off assets for short term gain is a long term, a smart long term policy. And again, the development, the, the, the option that was chosen may be the best option possible. It may have been the greatest option. You would never know because nobody's communicating on to us why this option was chosen. Why wasn't St. Mary's chosen? People love St. Mary's institution in town. I, there were people that were sitting there saying that St. Mary's was the best option. Yes, and, absolutely. And, 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 and it and may have been, but we'll never know because nobody from up high, meaning our elected representatives that I know of, and again, maybe I just was not around and I wasn't in the right channels of communication, sat down and explained why this won out over this, why this made economic sense over St. Mary's, why it made economic sense over the University of Maryland, or any of the other proposals. I think it was eight or seven kind of thing. Those three were the top three. We can argue back and forth whether the city's in financial straits or not. I mean, I know uh, we talked with Alderman Littman, who is, feels that the city is not doing too well financially. And uh, every year it seems that there's, as, as budget rolls around and everything else. But let's just for a minute assume that the city is in dire straits, needs money. As Alderman, how do you do that? Do you borrow more, raise taxes, cut services, all of the above, some of the above? Democracy is cruel to tough budgetary decisions when you're a politician. All right. That's, right. Just, that's how the system is. You raise taxes. You get, you've just garnered a lot of no votes. You cut entitlements, you've just garnered a lot of no votes. If you care about your job, you don't make these decisions. You don't touch it and you just pass it off to somebody else down the future. And that's what most politicians do. They make decisions that they don't have to worry about because whether it's good pension plans for different unions, whatever else, they're not going to be around for it. And then they, and they get to be reelected or go on. They don't have to put up with it. You know, it's a third rail. Nobody wants to touch mm -hmm. it kind of thing. I am not into raising taxes on people. I know there's inefficiencies in government. At first, I look for any inefficiencies across the board. Every employee, and look, there's some great, very excellent, intelligent, capable people work for the city. So I'm not beating them on city employees, all right? But you should go through every, every one, 500 plus, whatever, find out what they contribute and if, they, and if, if, they can, and if they're absolutely needed or not, okay? And then if they're not, and somebody else has to pick up their slack, Okay, some of the slack, some of their, some of their, whatever their responsibilities are. Well, maybe if you canceled a fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar contract, you could take five or ten to help out the people that are left behind doing mm -hmm. more work. Again, I'm not. That's one option. 
um, uh, and the option of looking at everything the city does. I mean, I mean, micromanage it. Why was that seven thousand dollar gum removing steam machine bought? <laughs> Whose head should roll for that? Somebody said should roll. Sure. Right? Who who got the grant money? Why was the grant money? Where was the oversight when the grant money was gotten and it was spent on two almost immediately useless pump out votes because they had a hybrid gasoline diesel engine which was notoriously finicky and hard to deal with and now when you put them on the government website they won't even sell like who made that decision and why wasn't these are rhetorical questions i know some of the answers to this but why isn't there an apparatus where there's a price to pay for making these kind of financial decisions you know, not just ambiguously somebody in the government did it and it won't happen again if you have no skin in the game you can make all kinds of no ramifications um, i would look at the use tax People come to the city. It's a beautiful city. We offer a lot. People aren't going to other cities that you know, I can name a number of them within 20 minutes of here. A lot of, yeah. People aren't going to a lot of other cities in this country. They're coming to Annapolis because it's beautiful and it's a great place to come. What about if you had your state representatives pass some legislation that imposed a hotel tax, a small amount, whatever it is, to help raise money, right? Um, so that you're passing on the, the uh, you're passing this on to not the people in our community, people that are visiting our community and getting so much out of it. So right. that, would be an, that would be an option. It's something to talk about. Maybe a horrible idea, mm -hmm. but at least talk about it. Right. So I'm not into, in, in effect, I'm not into raising taxes, and I am into reducing the budget. I would work on a 1% across the board budget reduction year by year until we get to where we have to be. 1%, go across the departments. Can we reduce 1% of your budget? You've got a ton of experience. I say you don't have the ton of experience, but sort of familial experience with the position of alderman and, and mayor and whatnot. Uh, so I think you probably know what's involved a little bit more than some of the candidates that are new coming into here. Uh, how many hours, I guess, are you prepared to donate? And I will say it's donate because the the stipend that you get is certainly now, not. I think it's thirteen thousand five hundred. So, yeah. In fact, I don't really know. Tells you that for sure. It might be up to fifteen thousand recently. I'm not sure. It's somewhere in that area. I did the math. If it's thirteen five and you put forty hours a week, you're making before taxes six dollars and fifty cents an hour to have a lot of people yelling at you. Yelling at you. <laughs> what are you doing it for? Right? Like I don't have enough. Yeah, I'm a working man. I work twelve to sixteen hours, you know, to, to rent, to work retail and, and, and keep your family in this part of Eastport requires a lot of hard work. Okay. That same kind of I know I am. I imagine I'm gonna be putting thirty to forty hours a week in if not physically, rolling up my sleeves in the streets, on the phone, emailing, forums, talking to people, you know, figuring out how to solve problems, thinking, well, this is coming up on the city council next week. How do we solve it? You know, I, I, that's where my mind goes. I can't help it. How do you plan, elected, how do you plan to keep your constituents up to date on what's happening in the ward or the city? Like your thoughts and whatnot, what specifics I, would I, you do to make sure that everybody is informed? Right, right, right absolutely. I, I think you use this, the, the social media forums, of course. And people who aren't into that, who are, because there are still people who don't really follow those. You have to go knock on doors and just call, hey, how you doing? Everything okay? You know, mm -hmm. And of course, you're not going to be doing that every day or even every week. You do it enough to make them feel like they're still on the radar, though. And you try, you know, hey, if you know anybody who has any issues, have them call me. Have them text me, whatever. And so that's, 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 that's I think, using the social media and using the uh, good old late work, you know, walking and, walking and knocking and your phone, your I think, I think that should cover all the bases. Let me get a little philosophical before we start to wrap up. There's always been said that there's two Annapolises, and primarily it's the upper class, wealthy, primarily white crowd. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got the lower, middle to low income, primarily African American or Hispanic community that's here. And there's this big chasm in between the two. How do you feel that we can take the steps to reduce that divide or eliminate it? I think you, ha you have to go outside the box. I'll give you an example. When you talk about redoing Harbor House or East Port Terrace, for example, or Bywalk, whatever, and you talk about, oh, we gotta find jobs for these people. We gotta find jobs for them, okay? Well, A, the reality of it is entry-level jobs are disappearing. They're not getting more. Uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, they're, they're, things are happening that are just they're making it tougher and tougher for people to find jobs. It's coming or what? Whether you know we like it or not, it's coming, right. right? So now you're talking about a population who may not have a car. So they're supposed to find a job that's disappearing farther away and not have easy transportation to, to, to maintain this job. So how do we solve that problem? Well, what about if you, when you redo it, when you knock down Harbor House or East Portes, which people talk about doing, and you restructure it, that you put places to make money in that development, 
what if there was a level of four or five or six studios or, uh, or shops where people could actually have businesses there? And I'll give you an example. What if you, if you knock down Harbor House and you restructure it in modern aesthetics, open, beautiful, everything else, you had an art studio, okay? And you had people who, and, and most artists love to be involved, they're, they're passionate about it. You had them coming by and working with the, uh, the constituency there to just come and do art, do art. And what if somebody there was good and they started putting up for sale? You go into City Hall, there's art for sale on the walls. Go in 49 West or, or Metropolitan or some other restaurants. The people have their art there all the time. What if you, you know, again, this may be a horrible idea, but it's an idea. Bring business to the community instead of trying to get the community to go out and find money. And you know, what if you put a restaurant, like the one that's on West Street, the, uh, the Lighthouse helped? What if you put a restaurant there, in a little small cafe or something, and you got people involved, that, and the money stays in the community? What, I mean, again, these ideas may not work out, but we're talking about something out of the box instead of, heck, we got this problem, what are we going to do about it, which we say every year. That we, right. we all know that these, uh, I believe, everybody knows, that Harbor House and Eastport Terrace, which I'm very familiar with, should be, uh, should be, should be modernized. If you go by, there's no, there's no way. People don't even have air conditions right now. All right, now now it's time for you. Pitch me. Why am I? Why tell me tell me a little bit about your background? Why I should vote for you if I could vote down here? Okay. Why why is Bumper Moyer supposed to be the next alderman for Ward Eight? All right. Let me let me back up and tell you why I want to run. Okay. Okay. Why I want to run? Why now? Uh, it's always been in the back of my mind because I come from a family of politicians that's spending. Uh, Don't say that too loud. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, they 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 they're admirable. My mother and father are admirable. They. Any discussion I ever heard in the background was never about retirement or higher office or money. It was about service to the community. Right? They believed in it. Right? I believe in it. Spending years of your life, some 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 years of your life in debt, in service to the community, humble service to the community is a fine way to spend those years. Absolutely believe in it. But I'm not like lots of young people, you're doing things. You're out and about, floating around, traveling, living for yourself, a little self-centered, and all that. And then I had a kid. And then I had another kid, and you start to, things start to change. Now, at the, uh, when I had my second kid, I have to pause here because I can collect myself, because when I tell the story, I start, to, I start to mess up a little bit. And it's not fake, I'm sorry, you can cut it out. The, um, it was special needs, and nobody, it was such a rare condition that nobody at Anne Arundel knew what it was. Doctors would come in, put their head in, maybe he has Downs, maybe he has this, maybe, and disappear, never to be seen again. And you're a mom with a kid who's barely alive, and you're just, you know, do you want answers? I want answers, but I'm a guy, I'm thinking, maybe it's not so bad, maybe it's just, you know, it was, it was a stressful birth, you know, and she knew right away, the instinct of mothering knew something was wrong. First open bed came up at, um, first open bed came up at um, Children's. We went to both to see where the first open bed, and um, I'm sorry, you got to cut a lot of this out, I'm sure. Um, hop, um, we go to Children's, and the wise old guy came out after a few hours there and stroked his chin and looked at the, the, our child. He said, I can narrow it down to one of five rare genetic disorders. I'll let you know within 36 hours. And he, um, he came back and he gave us the, you know, my, medical science is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And he came back with electronic, like electron microscope, look at the, uh, there, was, there was chromosomal deletion. Okay. Uh, the, 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 you know, we have what, how many chromosomes and that's, I forget now. But the 15th chromosome, there was some cellular, there was some deletion there, genetic mm -hmm. deletion. He goes, he has Prader Willi. And at the, at the base of Prader Willi is uh, what defines it more than anything is the mechanism that makes you feel full is turned off. So you're always hungry. Okay. You're bed hungry, you wake up hungry, you're insatiably hungry. Okay. That develops about two years in. The first year is a failure to fail, what's called a failure to thrive. So you don't have the muscle tone, you don't have the mechanisms to keep yourself alive just by suck, suckling your, your, your mother's milk. So the doctor says, listen, I'll tell you what it is. He set me down, very wise, old guy. And he goes, don't go home and look at this. Don't, don't go and look it up on the internet. You're gonna see the worst, <laughs> it's gonna break you, it's gonna break you. You're gonna see the worst, most sensational aspects of this, and it's gonna break you. He goes, I, I run in this all the time. He goes, I can't tell you what your life's gonna be like. So his development will determine what your life's gonna be like. Manage your life in small time chunks. It's the best advice I can give you. So I go home and I look it up. <laughs> and it broke me. I did. I mean, I'm sitting there just, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do this. My God, this is, you know, I've, 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 you know, I've dealt with addicts before. I've dealt with uh, lots of people who are driven insatiably 
And that's where he's going to be. That's ultimately what supposedly is going to happen. He's going to be driven to eat, 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 eat. You have to lock down your cabinets. You have to lock down your refrigerator. You know, you have to do everything you, because they'll kill right. themselves. They'll eat so much in one sitting they can kill themselves. Oh your, wow! Your stomach will burst. And, and it has happened in the group we network with. It did happen to somebody a couple of years ago, for example. Great parents, do everything they want, they're supposed to do. And they're at a party and people, hey, you can have a little bit. Oh yeah, and this relative, you can have a little bit. Anyway, I'm getting off point, but they can't have, anyway. So, but the first year is failure to thrive. So we come home, we have to be up 40 minutes of every, out of every uh, three hours. Your sleep is in two or three hour chunks, forever, until it, until it changes. My wife would be there pumping, and she's watching The Wire. She's binge watching The Wire to help her sure. through, you know, at the time, I remember. And I'm getting the milk and I'm putting the hose down. You have to have a hose down and make right. sure it's down to his lungs. So you have to put a stethoscope on and make sure you're hearing, you know, the right things. And the gurgling and The gurgling and all that stuff. Make sure you're not drowning your kid by putting the hose down into his lungs. And you have to do this. So you can't just wake up and be a zombie. You have to wake up and be as alert as possible because you're keeping your kid alive. And after two days of this, you're, you're done. You're, you're, you can't move. It's, it's very hard to function and do anything. I still have another kid who's normal. He has needs to be met. I still have to pay bills. She's not working. I have to pay all the bills. So my back's against it. We have to do this for 10 or 11 months. Long before that happens, within a week, people start showing up. Sorry. You'd hear a knock on the door. And they're there to help. People I've never seen before, people I didn't know, didn't care, they didn't care about was Democrat or Republican or Independent, if I had money or didn't have money. So they're here to help. They heard I was vegetarian, there was vegetarian dishes. They heard my wife likes meat, there was meat dishes. They just, you know, never saw a lot, many of them ever again. You know, after a few weeks or months or whatever they were doing this, they were just there to help. And I said, this is the best humanity has to offer. One day when I'm in a better position, I'm gonna give back. Sorry, I'm, uh, we can do this again. No, 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 not at all. Eight years later, I got out of some debt that I had incurred during this whole process. I had a little more freedom, a little less pressure on me. The only way to run and serve is to run, is to, is to, is to run. You have to try mm -hmm. if that's what you want. And that's what I want. I feel, um, sorry, I'm blowing this. No, no, not at all. Uh, I feel a great obligation in a sense of wanting to give back to the community. And well, ah, sorry, you probably no, can't sorry. use this, we can do this again. Anyway, so, and that's why now, the, once the pressure of getting out of this debt came off, uh, uh, I had time, I want to do it, I want to give back. And as I started, uh, and, and, and that coincides of, uh, with a lot of people tuning out and getting so frustrated with national politics that you don't want good people, good capable people to tune out because it's, it's the problems we face collectively need people to be involved, not good people who have ability to tune out. So I'm hoping with my campaign to get them to feel like somebody's listening to me, somebody I want to contribute because I'm being listened to. I'm coming, I'm com I'm coming to the table to, um, to get involved. I want to be the bridge to whatever their ideas, whatever knowledge, whatever skill, whatever wisdom they have, and the way the system is. And I, I don't think the system is working at, 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 uh, anywhere close to peak efficiency or, 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 or uh, is not doing the be being the best it could be in terms of uh, uh, facing the problems we all face together. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's why I'm here now. Now why, so to directly answer your question, I think I will listen and I will hustle and I will be there in a way that almost no other politician will be. I, I, I want, when you hear a story about a, uh, a police officer doing something bad, the natural response is giving officers a bad name. You never hear people say, that's giving politicians a good name. I want to give politicians a good name. I want to be there. I want your issues and your problems to be my issues and problems, and we're going to work on them and solve them together. And I know a lot of people, hey, do you mind if I get this, call this person up? And, he, 
and it doesn't have to be city related. You can have a tree fall down over your fence and you've got to go to work every day this week and you need to take care of it. Do you know anybody? Sure, I know somebody. I'll find the time to call them and call them a favor. Let me see if I can get them over to help you out. You know, or maybe we can do it on the cheap, that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's snowing out and you're 70 or 80 years old. We have a 10 inch snowstorm. I'm gonna have my people down there helping out. I mean, it's, so so it, it sounds kind of Andy Griffin-like, but, but I think if people constantly reaffirm the the best that we can be and listen and, and, and sincerely listen and care and, and, and consider what you're about or what your issues are, the, the system gets better. The system gets better. What are you doing for campaign? Where can people get in touch with you to talk to you? That, uh, your website, Facebook? Facebook is great. Text to me is better than calling me. If you have my number and it's on the government, the city website, the um, that you call me or text me, and that almost always is going to get a quick response. Facebook, I have a website. If you want to know my positions in more detail, uh, my, my positions on the issues, uh, local issues, you can go to friendsofjohnbumpermoyer.org. What was that again? Friendsofjohnbumpermoyer.org. Okay, that's a big long one. So it's, sorry, it's, it's, yeah, all, it's all spelled out, it's though. All spelled right? out. I apologize. Friends of John Bumper Moyer. Moyer. I tried to run just as Bumper Moyer because that's how, what I'm, how people know me. But you can't use a nickname on the ballot. So I had to use my first name, which I've historically right. never used. Find out more information at johnbumpermoyer.org. Dot org. Friends of John Friends of John Bumper so, Moyer. Or you can just go to you know, my friends of Jumper Moyer. Go on to Facebook John and look Bumper for Moyer. Yeah, look for Bumper Moyer on Facebook. You'll, you'll get to me soon. There's not too many of you. Not and too many. Do you have any, any fundraisers, any meet and greets, any community meetings I have coming up? one that's going to happen before this makes it on the airwaves. Okay. That's the 29th. It's a crab feast. But if you're listening to this, there'll be other crab feasts, at least two other ones I'm planning. When I say crab feast, I mean crab feast, fish fry. They haven't, they're not fundraisers, they're free. Um, something I'd like to note, I'm only taking $20 donations. Other people to my campaign per person, cash donations. Other people have sent me checks for more. That money, and you can look at my, um, my campaign finance report, that money, anything extra is gonna be put into a local charity in the, in, in the, uh, in the name of the person who gave, who gave me the money and the name of the campaign, I'm gonna donate it. And the reason I do it, I want people to feel they have access and it's not about money. I wanna take any amount of cynicism out of the system. And normally when in politics, what you hear about the problems, I'm not being listened to, and money, money rules everything. So for a $500 check, and I've you, got one. I got a five hundred. You, you you take twenty. I take twenty. And, Four eighty is going to go. I'm probably spread it out to six local charities: Back Creek Conservancy, Seven River Conservancy, Box of Rain. You know, right. Colonial School up here off of Bay Ridge. I think they're a nonprofit. I'll mm -hmm. probably give them eighty bucks. I'll find six charities and give them each eighty bucks. I, that's in theory. Maybe the Maritime Republic, um, the Maritime Museum. Any any you know, SPCA may get some. I don't know any. Uh, but they'll be, they'll, you're, you can see, you're, you're, again, a few months off the file on the campaign finance report, and you'll see the, all the information there. So. Well, I thank you for your time this afternoon, and we are with uh, John, quote, Bumper, unquote, yeah, I, Moyer. I bumper. You say Bumper. Uh, yes, bumper Moyer, who is running for alderman in Ward 8 in the Democratic primary versus uh, going against uh, current alderman, Ross Arnett. And more information on his positions, contact information, everything else is friendsofjohnbumpermoyer.org or go on to Facebook and he's got a page there and everything else there. Uh, thank you very much. No, thank you for the opportunity. Um, um, again, I appreciate it. So there you have it. Answers from a candidate or alder person in the city of Annapolis. Did they answer anything that was on your mind? If not, make sure you get in touch with them so you can make the best vote come September 19th in the primary election. Be sure to keep up to speed on the election at ionanapolis.net and also on the MarylandCrabs.com. It is an important election this year, so it is so important to get out and vote. And speaking of voting, the primary is on September 19th and the general election is on November 7th. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And after the primary, look for an announcement from us about a mayoral debate between the two survivors. Just like the forum in June, I on Annapolis and the Maryland Crabs will bring this to you, but this time it'll be structured more as a debate rather than a forum. Thank you for listening to this special election crab cake episode. Be sure to subscribe to the Maryland Crabs podcast. We have fresh stuff that drops every Thursday at noon. <laughs>